Today uh, we're back again in our, um, in our series on uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, once again, I want to take this opportunity this morning just to welcome all the people that are watching us on Facebook Live, that will watch us on YouTube. And uh, this morning I want to remind you that we'll be taking communion together. So please be ready to take communion with us at the end of the service. We appreciate you joining us today. Today we're going to talk about faith. And, um, but first of all, we have to establish what our superfood so our new superfood this week was Trader Joe's Bonsai Banana Bread. That's one of my, uh, that's one of my favorite superfoods. And uh, it's actually a very healthy snack because it's made out of wheat flour. So it's, it's better for you. So I was looking for a snack that I could uh, have that uh, basically uh, was a good. So I, I predominantly eat this. This is really over chocolate or anything. I don't eat hardly any kind of pies or cakes or anything like that anymore. This is what I eat. This is my... This is with a cup of coffee or a little bit of iced tea. That's what I have pretty much every day. And uh, so it's from Trader Joe's, so it's got to be good, right? Trader Joe's is loaded with goodness. So you, if you get a chance, you won't be disappointed with that. It's very, very good. So that's our healthy snack. Uh, my favorite food for this week is obviously, and I have to go healthy because I may go really unhealthy in the next week or two. So I have to kind of pick something healthy for this week. Uh, today, as we look at the spiritual fruit that is faith, you know, there is so much about faith in the Bible. I mean, just it's what a tremendous topic. I mean, you can literally teach and preach forever on the subject of faith. And so today, I really want to just kind of narrow it down. And I wanted to define some certain aspects of faith that I think that would, that would encourage us. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. This is where, this is where the Bible almost best defines what faith really is. Faith is the confidence that, we, that, that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Uh, through faith, people in the old days earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that we now know that, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Faith is a hope that is, that is absolutely certain. And... Uh, that what it believes is true and that what it expects will come to pass. That's what faith is. Faith is absolutely certain of the outcome of what's going to happen. It's not a hope which looks forward uh, in, in, in a wistful type way of longing, but it's a hope that looks forward with absolute conviction that God will do this, that this is God, and I believe with all my heart that this will happen. We expect it to happen. We do not accept that it won't happen. That's what faith really is. James Moffat distinguishes three directions in which Christian hope operates in faith the first one is is a belief in god against the world and so if we follow the world's standards we may well have ease and comfort and prosperity if we follow god's standards we may well have pain and loss and unpopularity at times it is a christian conviction that it is better to suffer with god than to prosper with the world Psalms 84.10 says, A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Now, I'm not preaching a doctrine that basically you're going to be miserable if you follow God. I'm simply saying that because you live in a world that often finds itself in opposition of the things of God, you're at times going to have unpopularity. You're going to suffer some for your faith. If you really stand up for what's right and you stand up for what's true, you're sometimes not going to be the popular person. You're sometimes not going to be the person that they're going to want to invite to the next birthday party because, you know, they may not want you there. You know, you, may, you, you represent something that they don't want. Now, here's the deal. As we do this in love, we find that there's a general acceptance most of the time. But there are times. There are times even in the best friendships, in the best relationships, where you have to say, look, you know, I love you. And we're friends. And you know I would do anything to help you and be there for you. But I have to draw a line here. This, this, I cannot cross this line. Honoring God is more important to me than anything else in my life. And I will not. I will not subject this conviction. I know that this is what God wants for my life. And I'm not judging you for your life. I'm just saying this is what God expects of me. And so I need to be faithful to God. And so we find that real faith causes us to, to follow God against every other advice. In the book of Daniel, we have this great story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're confronted with a choice of obeying King Nebuchadnezzar and worshiping the king's image or obeying God and entering the fiery furnace without hesitation they chose God. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. We take ourselves, we put ourselves in that moment. So here's all these people, the kingdoms lined up, the great statue there of Nebuchadnezzar. 
And everybody's been committed to bow and worship. And these three guys were left standing. You think, well, hey, man, that's, that, that's real. Here's, here's the thing about their solidarity. They knew that to stand meant their death. You think about that. They, were, they, weren't, just, they weren't just being a rebel. They weren't just protesting. They knew that for them to stand in that moment would mean that they would die, that they would be ordered to, to death by the king. So you think about that. It may seem like a really cool thing to protest against something, but you don't feel so confident about it if you know that your protest is going to lead to your death. And so here we find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who love God, serve God, said, look, our deal is, O oh, king, we, you know, we can't honor anybody but God. We cannot bow to anyone but God. And so we find that, but without hesitation, even though they knew what the punishment would be, they still stood up for God. And so we look, the Christian attitude is just that, just like that. In terms of eternity, it's better to stake everything on God than to trust the rewards of the world. And uh, I, maybe you've used that terminology in your own life before. I'm, I'm staking everything on God. I'm putting, I'm putting all my eggs in that basket that God's going to be faithful and he's going to take care of us. The Christian hope is a belief in the spirit against the senses. Now here we find with Shadrach, Meshach, and Bingo, they, they were delivered from the fiery furnace. If we know the story, that God delivered them unharmed from that fiery furnace. But I want to tell you something. They stood up. And they were realized that they may have died in the fire. You know, they realized that, that it could well have been that, that that would have been their stand for God, that they had become martyrs for the Lord. But here we find that God delivered them. You know, the, sense, the senses tell us, and a lot of times we want to follow our senses. The senses tell us that to take what you can touch and taste and enjoy. The senses tell us to grasp the things of the moment, and the Spirit tells us that there is something far beyond that. And so Christians believe and follow the Spirit rather than our impulses. One of the things that gets us in trouble the most often in our life is when we follow our impulses. And you know, we have terms for this in society called that person is an impulse buyer. What, what are they saying when they say that person is an impulse buyer? They see it, they like it, they take it home. They're an impulse buyer. Then they face the wrath of whoever is at home when they get there. <laughs> impulse buyers, they just, they just, it's the moment. It's momentary satisfaction. It's the thing with, the thing with eating is a lot the same way with food. You know, impulse. You know, we see something, we like it, we can't resist it, and we don't think about the consequences, you know. And so we just eat it because we want it. There are people that participate in, in, uh, in partying in this world, and then they way overindulge because at the moment it's great. They're having a good time with their friends, but they don't think about what that can lead to and what, what the after effects is that's going to be. And so as we begin to look at that, so following our senses like that, we have to be very careful because it leads us to follow our impulses. And so we want to follow the Spirit. As Christians, we realize that, look, there, there's more to me just being happy at this very moment. See, there, there's more to me just being happy right now. I'm looking for the long term. If, you, if you've been in a long-term marriage, you know that you had to take this type of view to your marriage. You know, I may not be thrilled every day. And we may have some very tough days that we have to walk through, maybe with each other, maybe with our children, maybe with things outside of our marriage. But you know what? In the long term, I'm committed to the good of this, that I know that it's going to bring me long-term happiness is in this relationship if I stay faithful to what I want to do. But if I allow myself to be swayed by impulses, I'm going to destroy the long-term happiness. And so we look at our relationship with God the same way. You know, I'm going to follow God, even though it may be unpopular for me to make that decision today, and maybe, maybe it seems like I'm missing out on something. The reality is, is I'm looking towards eternity. I'm looking for God to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. I'm looking forward to my time, my afterlife in heaven with my family and my friends and enjoying the saints of God. I'm looking forward to being with Jesus. And I have to remember those things when I'm saying no to some things that sometimes I like to say yes to. Because the reality is, is that God does not want us to say yes to things that will break our lives, that will hurt our lives. The Christian hope is a belief in the future against the present. Long ago, the Greek philosopher Epicurus said that the chief purpose of life was pleasure. But a lot of people misunderstood that. He didn't mean that at all. And many people thought he meant that. But what he meant was he insisted that we must take the long view, is what he was saying. The thing which is pleasant at the moment may sooner or later bring pain. The thing which hurts like fury right now may eventually bring joy. You know, one of the things I think about... As a kid, you know, one, of you, one of the things that you hate as a kid is getting a sliver in your finger. You get a, get a really good redwood sliver 
buried in your finger underneath the skin, not where it's sticking out. That means that surgery has to happen by usually a family member who's not trained very good at this. You know, if the surgery was your mom, it's a needle and, and usually like a, you know, usually like a needle. Maybe we'll put, kind of pull it out there. If surgery with your dad, it's a pocket knife. It's, it's, a, it's like, you're, I don't think you're not trained to be a surgeon. I can tell by looking at it. Ah, yeah. Put that knife out. We'll take right care of that right now. So we hate the idea. It's going to be painful sometimes. It is painful most of the time to get a sliver out. But once it's out, what happens? You feel a lot better. You feel a lot better. But if you leave it in there, what happens? It festers. If you leave it in there, remember, have you ever been a kid and you didn't want somebody to take the sliver out and so you didn't tell anybody? And like day three, you're like, oh, you're like dying. And then they still got to dig it out. It hurts even worse. And so there are things in life that basically for the moment, it seems wonderful. But sometimes you forget that it's going to lead to pain. Sometimes some of these senses that you follow, you're, it's going to end up being something. It's joy now, but it won't be in the future. But sometimes things are difficult right now. Sometimes you're going through a very difficult time, but you can look and say, look, in the future, it's going to be better. One of my favorite conversations to have with Joanne is we talk about our future, talk about this year and next year. Say, you know, this, this is going to be a great month for us. This is going to be a great fall. Next year we're going to accomplish this. And so look forward to the future that we have. Sometimes the moment that you're in is not the moment that you really like to be in. But the truth is you know that there are going to be better moments ahead. And so we always have to remember that. That's what the philosopher was trying to teach us in that. Christians are certain that in the long run, no one could put aside truth. So when you stand for truth, you're going to end up being right in the long run. Great truth is in the end, it will always prevail. Truth will always prevail in the end. Even though truth may condemn you in the beginning, in the end, if you stand for what is true, you will be vindicated by what is right. It'll just happen. It'll happen. The Bible even says things about, you know, that, that your sins will find you out, that nothing is hidden from God. And so, basically, if you stand for what's right, it will come to pass. I think about one of the uh, things that helps us, one of these analogies that we have today that kind of shows us the difference of who has the upper hand. It seemed that Nero, who basically had conquered the truth of Apostle Paul's message, he condemned the Apostle Paul to death. But the truth of Paul's message still lives today. The Apostle Paul's message still lives today and still touches lives. And here's what, here's what fate does in the long term. In the near term, it seemed like Nero had destroyed Paul, that he had overcome Paul, that he had got the victory over Paul's truth. But Paul's truth ends up coming out. And we're reminded every day that while, that while I think about the Apostle Paul, that many people name their children after Paul. I have cousins that are named Paul, but people name their dogs after Nero. And so I want you to think about that. So you may think you're the king for that moment, but you're not the king now. So how many, how many boys you know this name Nero? Not too many, I don't think. But you know a lot of the name Paul. You go look at the keychains there at the store, you know. You, know, you go through that age where you want to have a, you look for your name every time, you know, like on Coke bottles or keychains. You know, you're going to find Paul with no problem. You're not going to find Nero. Maybe on the dog leashes, but not in the keychains for people. The writer of Hebrews says that it is an act of fate to believe that God made this world and adds that things which are seen emerge from things that are not seen. The writer of Hebrews insists that God did not work with existing material but created the world from nothing. That's a truth that you have to grasp. Once you accept God's word as truth, the world was made by God. This world belongs to God. You can trust that while at times it doesn't look like that God is in control, that God is always in control, and the world is always in His hands because He created the world. What do you believe about creation, Pastor Phil? God created this world from nothing, just exactly what Hebrews says. That's what I believe because I have faith. Everything about our whole walk with God is based on faith, that God took nothing and made something out of it. And once you grasp that belief, you know that God's got control of everything. You don't have to worry about what happens in life. Once you hang on to your faith that solidly. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, we're going to talk just for a few minutes. I'm going to read a few scriptures about some of the great people of faith. It's a very encouraging chapter. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. 
And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed and called, and God called him to leave his home and go to another land that God would give him an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land, God promised him he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God could keep his promise. And so the whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country that they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say that it was precisely because these great heroes of the faith lived on the principle that God was in control, that they were approved by God. That was the principle of their life. Every one of them refused what the world calls greatness and staked everything on God, and history proved them right. According to Scripture, some of us have been given more than the fruit of faith, but have been given the gift of faith. There's two things I want to talk about when it comes to faith today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, one Spirit gives the gift of healing. So this, this certain verse is talking about specific gifts that we see operate in people's lives, different than the fruit of the Spirit. Over my lifetime, I've had a few friends that operate in the gift of faith. And most recently, it was Pastor Ruth Wood, who recently went on to be with Jesus. And um, her story was that she was, a, she was a divorced single mom of four boys. And uh, she owned and operated a cleaning business for many years. And she was very involved in praying for people for every kind of situation. Very faithful to her church, very involved, worked very hard to raise her sons. Some 20 years ago, she moved out to California from Ohio. And she meets my dad and my mom. And she shared with him her desire to spend the rest of her life caring for God's people. She became the pastor of the Blythe Church of God. You probably heard me talk about her before. She pastored the church for 10 years before her health began to fail. And then she returned east to be close to her adult sons and their families. The Blythe Church thrived both spiritually and financially under her care. Many people were healed and encouraged because of her strong, unwavering faith. Anyone who ever knew Ruth Wood would tell you that that woman had steadfast, amazing faith, that she truly had the gift of faith. That's not something you say lightly, but you'll never meet anyone that knew her very well at all that says she had great faith. She could believe God for anything, financially, healing, people, relationships. I mean, she had un incredible faith. She prayed with people. One of the things about her that people don't know about her, in the early part before she became a pastor, she actually prayed for leaders. When uh, One of the things I was thinking about um, I won't mention the names to, for the family's sake, but she actually, one of the stories about her was that she actually stayed and prayed with one of these leaders that had lost one of their children. And she stayed with them and prayed several days in their home with them and helped them through their loss. I mean, it's tremendous stories about this woman. In fact, part of that thing was she actually laid at the foot of their bed and prayed over them so that God would help them. Amazing. <laughs> it's hard not to get emotional. I think about yeah. Ruth and what a great lady. So how about the rest of us? The Bible tells us in Romans 12 that we have each been given a measure of faith. Now, I don't believe that I have the gift of faith. Sometimes I think it's there, but I know I have a measure of faith. I have the fruit of faith in my life. The gift of faith is a tremendous gift. So I, I try to exercise it, but, you know, do I have the greatest faith? Not sure, but I have a measure of faith. So how about the rest of us, that we all have a measure of faith? Each one of us have that. So how does faith work in us? 
How does faith work in us? We can exercise our personal faith to believe God for our personal needs and for those of our family. We can pray for and believe with others for their needs. That's what we do when we come together and we pray over one another. We're exercising faith. When you come up here at the end of the service and you pray with people, you're exercising your faith. You're exercising the measure of faith that God's given you. That he's going to bless them. He's going to heal them. He's going to provide for them. He's going to take care of them. That's us exercising our faith. But the fruit of faith is even more than that. It's just more than exercising faith that way. Faith by its very nature implies that I can see good in others outside of myself. I have faith in this person. We used to use that term often in our world. I have faith in you. I believe in you. That's how faith works and operates. So we have faith in another person. And so as I begin to look at this, faith is my deliberate and positive response to the good in another person to the extent that I will act on their behalf in a very personal, powerful way. I'm going to exercise my faith to help them, to reach out. Even if I just see the smallest spark of good in them, I'm going to reach out to them in faith and believe God for them and with them. Jesus always was looking for the evidence of faith. When you look at the New Testament, you look at Jesus was always excited when he saw people that were expressing faith. He was overjoyed. Even the smallest demonstration of faith, always Jesus would mention. He would make a specific mention other faith. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus responds to the Romans' officers' faith was, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And what was he talking about? That, that officer's servant was healed because the officer had faith in Jesus. If you know the story, he basically said, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. You know, I'm a man under authority. And so basically, if you speak it, it's going to be that way. I have faith to believe that you just speak it and it's going to happen. And so we begin to look at that. We're going to realize that that's what faith is. We, our faith is, I believe that God is going to take care of it regardless. They're going to say, well, you know, we talk about as we pray for one another. We come together and we lay hands on each other and we pray for one another. We're saying that when two or three are together, God is in the midst of us. Our faith is believed that He is there touching that person. He's there healing and bringing answers to their situation. The Christian hope that his faith is such that it dictates every aspect of the way a Christian conducts themselves. And we live in it and we die in it and we put in the possession of it is what influences everything we do. If you're a person of faith, your life is about faith. I believe, I believe in living a life of faith. You know, there's a singer, probably some of you have not heard of her. Her name was Nancy Harmon in the Victory Voices. And she was around for a very long time. And she used to sing this song, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed out begging for bread. And one of the interesting verses that she talked about is she talks about, he'll bless you once, he'll bless you twice. I've been living on blessings all my life. And what she was saying is, I've been living by faith my entire life. I've really been living by everything I have is by faith. And so as you begin to grasp it, so that was her song to express that, you know what, that's, that's where my faith is. I've always trusted God. I still trust God. And God is going to see me through all this. It influences every decision that we make because we have faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The good news tells us God makes us right in his sight, is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. We live and breathe and have our means through faith. Faith makes everything possible about us. You know, love and faith coexist together. We talk about how important is faith. It's important to have faith. We reach out. We make decisions. This morning we were talking in, in, uh, in discipleship class about someone that, you know, Christine's talking about reaching out to someone in faith. By faith, we're going to reach out and offer something, put it out there. By faith, we're going to believe that, that that's going to make a difference in that person's life. We live our whole lives that way. We have to trust God. If we don't trust God, how, how miserable our life would be. You know, I know that God has got it all in control. Whenever you're having issues with your health, whenever you're having issues with your children, whenever you're having issues in your marriage, if you're having issues with your neighbors or issues on your job, you have to have faith to believe that God sees all those things. And by faith, He's going to make things right. And you just keep making positive faith steps, and God begins to bless. And God begins to change things. He begins to change the elements of what's happening in your life. And, uh, you know, when we begin to grasp that, and we, and we don't doubt God, we say, you know what, God is in control of my life. And I don't have to worry about Him because I know that He cares about me. I think about often, you know, that He holds the whole world in His hands. And I'm thinking about the, the song that talks about that um, His eye is on the sparrow. And I know He watches me. You know, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he watches over me. 
and we realize that God has got his eye on us. God is always looking after us and looking for us. And so by faith, we can take hold of these things. I want you to think this morning before we pray. There's probably been a few people in your life that have left a lasting impression that they had the gift of faith and they could believe for everything. And part of it was believing with you for things in your life, praying good, great things for you. And so we can exercise that kind of faith. I've known several of those kind of people over my lifetime, and God really blessed them and blessed me through their ministry. I tell you, if Ruth Wood was here today, you'd want her to pray for you. I promise you that. People would line up to have her pray for them because she prayed with real power and real faith all the time. We can have that kind of faith too. We just have to trust God. We have to know that God is in control of all things at all times, and nothing escapes God. God never sleeps. He never varies. He's always the same. And his faithfulness to us is unquestionable. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that I, I have faith in you. I trust you for all these things, Lord. I'm not indecisive about who made this world. I'm not decisive about who put the stars in the sky. I don't have any, There's no indecision in my life about who's in control of all things. You are in control of all things, God. I know that whatever's going on in my life, you're well aware of it. And you're watching after me all the time. You're watching after every person here today that we're praying with. Lord, you're, you're looking at the situations in our life and you realize that sometimes it feels a little bit lonely and sometimes we feel like we've made a, a tough decision. We find ourselves in a hard place, maybe an unpopular decision, Lord, but we're looking for eternity. We're looking, we're looking at the eternal. That We know that we stand for what is right and just and true. It will always vindicate itself in the long run, God. So today I pray, give us constant strength to exercise our faith, to just keep believing that no matter what the news says, no matter what someone else says, no matter what discouraging word that may come across our way, say, Lord, I believe in you. I believe in the truth of your word, and I know you're going to see us through this. I know that you're able to keep us in every situation. And so, Lord, we just want to re, you know, we talk about our trust in God. Just to, to come back and say, Lord, once again, I believe in you. I believe in your ability to take care of me, your ability to take care of those people that I love. Or that none of this has caught you by surprise. While I may be surprised about some of the situations that I'm facing now, Lord, you knew that I would face these situations, and you readied my heart to put my trust in you, to walk me through every one of these situations. So I will put my trust and my faith in you today, Lord. I ask you just to bless us today, God. Bless us as we prepare our hearts to receive communion. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. takes faith. Romans 1 17. The good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. I don't think anything takes more faith than communion. That this bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ, that when we partake this, that we believe the stripes that are born in his back 
that we are healed because of Jesus' sacrifice. That takes faith. It takes faith to believe that you're holding that wafer in your hand today, as you partake of that wafer in your hand, that God is here for your healing, that Jesus can heal you. And so let's take this. What may even take more faith than that is the cup. It represents the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to pray here in just a second over the cup. But this little cup here, this little cup, the representation of the blood of Jesus, that the blood of Jesus cleansed me from every sin, that my sins are completely cleansed because of that sacrifice. And when I take this cup, it is once again a celebration by faith once again proclaiming that I, that my sins are forgiven because Jesus sacrificed on the cross. Father, I thank you right now, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. It is that supreme sacrifice that makes us each one able to partake today. Each one to be able to drink from the cup and say, Lord, I believe and I accept your forgiveness for me. Once again today, Lord, I celebrate that I am forgiven. I am made whole and clean through the complete sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Let us take the cup. I pray that God will bless you and keep you today, encourage you this week, and uh, exercise faith. Never, never forget, we're looking for the eternal. God bless you.